Our Lunch and Learn, you are tuning in at Chabad of Kerry. This is our Tuesday Lunch and Learn when we explore that week's Torah portion through the eyes of the Bible, the Talmud, the Kabbalah, and we see its relevance in our daily lives today. A very special thank you to Amnon Nisan of Nisan Communications for graciously hosting our program every single Tuesday. If you would like to support and ensure that this uh, hosting can continue every single week. There is a donate page on nissancommunications.com where you can donate to the program and make sure that we can be here live every single Tuesday for our session of Lunch and Learn. Yes, let's begin with the brachis on our food first for the general study of Torah. Baruch. Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedishanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Al Divrei Torah And a bracha on the, the, the bagel Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Amotzi Lecha Min Ha'as You know, so Torah, of course, has its body and its soul. It has its garments, the external component of Torah, and it has its spirituality. And often we look at this as two sides. You know, there is the external and there's the internal. But the true way of looking at it is every single story in Torah has both. Every single law in Torah has both. Even the most technical and legal laws has a spiritual component. And what we're going to do today is give an example of a very technical business ethic kind of law. And that alone will be an interesting discussion. But in the last 10 minutes, we will show how that very same law also has a spiritual component to it and has Kabbalistic meaning as well. So business ethics is where we go today. It's in the Parsha. Um, reminds me of the story where there is a boy that asks his father, Dad, what does business ethics mean? Well, Dad says, Dad's a lawyer. And he says, well, uh, imagine, you know, a client comes and... Uh, asks me what the price is for the service, and I say $1,000, gives me a wad of cash all together, and mistakenly gives me 2000 instead of 1000 So business ethics would be, do I tell my partner or not? <laughs> all right, just to start off on a light note. Um, the Parsha begins with the laws of the Shemitah, which is the sabbatical year in Israel, and it's interesting because this year in Israel is a sabbatical year which means that the farmers, the observant farmers in Israel, are not planting or plowing this entire year. And that is a law that applies until today. There's another law, however, that only applied in biblical times, and that was that every seven cycles, there was the 50th year, which in Hebrew is called the Yovel, in English it's called the Jubilee year, and that had its own complete set of laws. And one of the fascinating parts of Yovel was that that was the year where... Anyone know what, what happened in the yoga? So A is any servants went free automatically. Normally a servant only served for seven years and afterwards they went free, but they could choose to stay the easy life and remain with their master, in which case they would go, they would stay on. However, the Jubilee year, the yoga year meant they went free no matter what. And one other important law. Like <coughs> back to his yeah. Land, most land went back to its original owner. Essentially what that meant is in biblical Israel you never really owned a lot of land. When you sold land you really leased it. And just imagine what the world would look like if no, no one person could gobble up, you know, huge amounts of land. It was essentially only a lease. So yeah, someone could get wealthy, but they had 50 years to do it. At the end of 50 years, all land would revert back to the original owner which got it through their biblical inheritance. Those laws don't apply today, but that was 
what the Yovel um, meant. And what the Torah says is, essentially, anytime you would sell land, you would the price of the land wouldn't just go by how many acres it was or how many square feet the building was. But how long? How many years were left until Shemitah? Because if Shemitah was in three years, this is not a sell of land. This is a three-year lease. Did I say Shemitah? I meant Yovel. If, however, Yovel Jubilee was a few years earlier and you had another 45 years, well, the price would go a lot more. So the Torah in Leviticus 25.14, Brian, why don't you begin 25.14? And when you page make... 86. Page 86 in And when you page. make a sale to your fellow Jew or make an acquisition from the hand of your fellow Jew, you shall not wrong one another. You shall not wrong, you should not cheat. And literally what it says is the price needs to reflect the Yovel years. But from these words, do not wrong another in business, is a huge amount of literature in the Talmud about all sorts of business ethics. About when you have any sale, you have to be on the same page on what is being sold. And if there is dishonesty in the sale, the sale is not valid. And this has many, many, many rules. Uh, you know, what we might refer to as ethics actually has a legal component in Judaism. We've had many courses about this, um, but it goes as far as if you're at a garage sale and you notice a real treasure buried over there and you buy it for $7, it's not so simple that you can do that. Okay? Not so simple. You don't have to necessarily disclose to the owner everything. You don't have to tell them what it's appraised at. But according to these laws, you would have to at least say, by the way, I want you to know that what you're selling has some value as an antique. They have to be aware of what they're selling. If they think they're selling a piece of junk, a piece of junk and it's really something of greater value, there's a mistake there. It's called a mekach ta'ut. There's a mistake on the sale because what you thought you were selling was not the same as what the other person was buying. So there's a whole host of issues over here. Um, the same would apply with selling something under false pretenses. You don't disclose all the faults of it. And there's laws there as well. But that's quite different than the, I found a gem. Correct. And, and I'm, I'm buying it at exactly what the seller wants. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not deceiving him. He's not de deceiving me. You know, what we're saying is um, failure to disclose the whole truth, even by the buyer here, is a, is a problem. And I think that's, that's unique. Many places will have laws where you have to... Uh, Disclose the seller has to disclose the problems. The bit there's a bad right. foundation. And, and so of course, on. the buyer on the buyer side, his compensation has to be genuine. You can't write a false check. And Correct. Whatnot, you Correct. Know. But this idea that even the buyer has to be on the same page that's that's very unique. That's mm -hmm. very unique. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the seller goes, there's there's other interesting laws. Uh, after that, we had that course a few years ago. Someone called me one day with this question. The question was, and I, what I loved about the story is they took these laws so seriously that they wanted to incorporate it into their regular life. And the question was that they had a problem with their car and they went to the dealership and the dealership told them this is a pretty big deal. And they gave them what the repairs would cost and it was substantial, substantial. They really didn't want to invest at that point that much into the car. They went across the street to uh, one of the, whether it was CarMax or another one of those kinds of places and say, hey, how much do you buy my car for? And they gave him an amount, far greater than what the dealership said. He called me, he said, Rabbi, must I disclose the problem that the dealership had told me about when I sell it to here? I think I mentioned this question to you, Hal. That one's tricky. I, 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 you can say yes by the rule we just read. Well, actually, no, no, no this, he's a seller. But then you could say no because someplace like CarMax, they inspect the cars and they're experts. So actually that is the answer. The answer is that if you were selling it to a novice, what's called a regular person, you would have that obligation. If you are selling it to another expert, to another professional, for all you know, they could be right and the dealership could be wrong. Yes. They are experts in the field and there's not a need to do that. And the reason I bring this up is not because the, answer, the guy got the answer he wanted, which he did. It's not so clear cut, and in halacha, in Judaism, there are so many nuances. So I want to make it very clear that uh, do not wrong one another is very, very nuanced.
However, today's class is going to focus on another Hebrew word here, and that's kano, kinyan. Kinyan means acquisition. In the Talmud, there are many laws as to what constitutes an acquisition. At what point does the item or the land switch hands? Okay? Essentially, when you buy something, two things happen. You pay money for something, and an item leaves the jurisdiction of the seller and enters you. What constitutes the sale? Okay? What, when? When? What effectively makes this kinyan? And I bet what makes it tricky is if what if that sale was, let's say, livestock? Correct. And in the period between when the agreement was made and the seller received the livestock, the livestock went off and damaged something. Beautiful. Right. That's probably where, right. where the, the, the trouble is. Correct. And this is a question in the Talmud. In the verse it says, you make an acquisition from the hand of another, and we'll have other verses over here. At what point does the transaction happen? Or uh, you go to the diamond, you go to a jewelry store, and you buy that tennis bracelet for your wife, and um, you know you agree to the sale price of three thousand dollars, and they say, by the way, I'm just going to package it for you very nicely, and whatever else, come tomorrow morning, and it'll be all ready. Or maybe, and let's assume that there's no return policy here. I know this is not a good example because today there's return policies, but let's just pretend there's no return policies. Can you back out of the sale at that point? The item has not entered your hands. You paid money for it, but the item has not entered yeah. your hands. Can you back out or can the seller back out and now someone else comes that's willing to pay more for it? These are the types of differences that would happen, the practical ramifications. Um, you go on Craigslist and you buy yeah. you know, uh, a, a secondhand a, 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 a cabinet or, or, or a bike bike from someone and you PayPal them. You PayPal them in advance. Can there be, at that point, the seller say, hey, I found someone else that can pay me more? What do you say? I'd say if somebody says they can pay you more, you cannot back out at that point. But if, some, if the purchaser who used their PayPal says they want to back out for, unfortunately, I think they can. Um, like they say, well, we had a discussion and I decided not to buy this item. But they've already paid for it, so they at that point can still have a refund. You're saying that being that they did not claim, they didn't pick it up yet. Yeah. You're saying the changing of hands really Hasn't is happened. what, yeah. so that's our question. What constitutes a sale? Now, in the event of real estate, there might be what's called a star. A star is a document. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the document there signs that. Okay, that might be different. But there too, there's two things. There's the document, and then there's the, 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 the giving over of money. There's usually um, a certain number of day period of when Due other, diligence other and actions can be taken to back out of something. Well, that is if you have conditions. Correct. Our question is, if the store doesn't have a return policy, if no, someone is right. on Craigslist, yeah. and there isn't the diligence period, right. what constitutes the sale. At what point are you now at their mercy? They could either agree to do it or not legally. I, I would think it would be the case that when you you agree, and it's, especially as part of the trans, transaction transpires, that that is a binding commitment and you'd have to both agree to undo it. That would be what I would So the think. verbal agreement alone? I yeah. would think that would be well, enough. Oh, please. I'm sorry. At the time, it was not even signing the document, it was maybe maybe shaking hands. Sure. Mm -hmm. And and that's that. And neither party could uh, recant that uh, offer. So does that signing so of hands... Now, I, there's two issues here. There's what's the right thing to do, and what's the menschlich thing to do, to use Yiddish, to be a mensch. And then there's at what point can you legally go back? And there are certain times, perhaps, where well, you might strive to be a mensch, but then you had some big misfortune happen to you that night. And you say, you know what, in this situation, I would like to be able to back out of the sale. Uh, Are you allowed to or not? Uh, so that, that is our question yeah. here. And, and that this is a, an issue in the Talmud. There are pages in the Talmud really? and books actually written about this. A debate in the Talmud, text 2a, shows us the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. 2a, page 86. Do you want to read in your name? 2a, page 86. This is from the Talmud. Yeah. As Rabbi Yochanan states, 
biblically, money affects Where are we? No, no, the one Where above that. No, 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 she's good. No, no. Yeah. 2A. 2A. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. 2A. Top. 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 No. I don't know that you were yeah, here and start there. That's the one. Rabbi Yohanan said, by biblical law, the delivery of money affects possession. Why then was it mechecha, pulling the item, affects possession? Lest the vendor said to the buyer, your wheat was burnt in the loft. But after <laughs> all, whoever causes the fire must make compensation. But for fear, lest a fire accidentally break out. Now, if the ownership is still vested in the vendor, he will wholeheartedly take pains to save it. If not, he will not do so. So Rabbi Yochanan says, according to strict biblical law, once money is given, the sale happened. The rabbis, however, put a fence around us. The sages said that we want to make sure that the owner takes proper care of that item even after money has been given. Mm -hmm. Why? Let's say there's a fire. Let's say there's another problem. He shouldn't say, it's not my item to worry about anymore. He should be careful with that item until it changes hands. And as a result, that full acquisition does not happen until the item changes hands. This is the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. So again, this is a fence. Biblical law, money transferred, done deal. Rabbinic law, Rabbi Yochanan said, they wanted to ensure people would take proper care, and therefore they said the changing of hands is needed. I say do the right thing. Because he's, I live with that. Do the right thing, he's watching me. He's going to punish me if I don't. I live with that. Some people that's good for. But you need to create a civilization, a society that, again... The people that don't live with that mindset, there's still rules. There's still, you know, there was definitely a bet in. There was a Jewish court for a reason. People took each other for court. Now, would it be much better if everything could just be resolved peacefully? Absolutely. But unfortunately, we have to take the realities of the world into consideration. And that is what many of these rabbinic bands did. We'll see in a moment about what the menschlich and the right thing is. But legally, he says, it has to change hands. Yeah. But it's still a binding commitment, you know, until he couldn't deliver, you know, when he couldn't deliver, let's back up. The merchant is still compelled to deliver yes. unless he actually cannot. Interesting. It, like, like it burned down. Well, we'll see in a moment. We'll okay. see in a moment. So okay. text 2B is okay. also, um, he, it just brings a scriptural, whenever the rabbis gave, put a fence around the law and the Torah, often they would give a scriptural kind of reference to it, and he... He shows a text in the Torah where he says, and he gives the money and it should be his. Yeah. So that shows that essentially from the Bible at least, money alone should make the difference. However, text 3a, which summarizes this opinion again, Hal, Maimonides writes, According to scriptural law, both livestock and other movable property acquired by the payment of money. Once the purchaser pays the money, neither he nor the seller can retract unilaterally. <clears throat> the sages, however, enacted that movable property should be acquired only through lifting up the article, Agbalaha, or calling Mishkabha, an article that is not commonly lifted up. Right, a cow you don't lift up. But what do you do with the cow? Yeah, you, you pull it. You, you, you change it into your jurisdiction. Right. Um, a regular item is Hagba. Hagba means lifting it up. So the lifting or the pulling is what acquires it rabbinically. Biblically, money alone does. Um, okay, so you go buy a piece of bread, you give money, you lift your bread, you go home. Correct. That's your sale. Correct. And that's your... The challenge is what happens when they're 24 hours apart or 48 hours apart. That's really our question over here. In the case of buying something from the store, it's very simple. You pay and you take it at the same time. There's really not going to be a period of contention over there. But you pull the cow to your farm. Correct. It's yours. Correct. A, a real life example. Yeah. My father purchased a car. He was at the dealers, doing the dealer, you know, prepping yeah. it. That night, the dealership burnt down. Oops. With the car in it. With the car in it. Lovely. Oh my gosh. Whose insurance 
there was a big argument on whose insurance oh. covers the car. Wow. Did ownership switch? This is incredible. This is a, this it is... was paid for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was still in the possession of the, but it's the dealer one... doing work now right. for the customer. But while in the possession of the dealer, the dealer is responsible to maintain and protect that car until... And that would be this rabbinic fence that we're discussing. Yeah, I, I would think I that, think yeah, the, the rule would be the same as if I brought my car there for service yeah, and it burned down. Yeah, you took the liability to protect your car. I would until, think, but yeah. apparently it's not that simple, or it wouldn't have what been What did end up happening? In a, the, the insurance companies got into a fight. Both of them? Both of them, yeah. because both of them said the other one still had the ownership, mm -hmm. right. because it was the responsibility to take care of, and the take care of says we did take care of it. It was a net. It was a fire. We did nothing. As the the owner of the insurance, right. it ended up that it was the then the argument came: is it list price or devalued price? Because it had switched legally ownership, wow. so did wow. the price go down? And then so there was an argument about the price too. Of eventually, the dealership had it, but there was a tweak of reduction of price. Okay. Yeah. And didn't we have a whole yeah. bunch of narrative about this last month or a couple of months ago about the, the, who, the insurance people were missing a mention <laughs> responsibility of who's um, who cares for yeah. an yeah. item? We we talked right. we talked in length about right, right. that was with regard to loading items and all that. Or, yeah, or, yes, or, yeah. or, or babysitting or looking after something. It seems like this is very connected. Because it was already owned, and this person had the status of a guardian. Of a guardian. Right. Very interesting. That would be another way of looking at this. Mm -hmm. The thing is, being that this was still, I don't know if you would say that here just because the sale wasn't final. The last Meshicha didn't happen. So I don't know if you would at that point give them the category, the status of a guardian. Because the sale is still you don't in the automobile case? going to his automobile case. Yeah, yeah, he clearly hadn't taken possession. Yet. He hasn't taken possession of it yet. If someone takes possession and then it goes back to the automobile dealership for service, then you would say they're a custodian, they're a they're but a guardian. He's getting the title possession. Well, we said Mashiach didn't yet happen here, so this is a classic case. Now let's do the next text, Debbie. Text eighty-eight. <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah. Okay, text number <laughs> 3B. Mm -hmm. Why did our sages make such an ordinance with regard to movable property? This decree was enacted lest a purchaser pay for an article and before he takes possession of it, it be destroyed by factors beyond his control. Example, <laughs> a fire breaks out <laughs> and burns yes. it, or thieves come and take it. If the article is considered as in the possession of the purchaser, the seller may hesitate and not endeavor to save it. For this reason, our sages ordain that the article remains the possession of the seller so that he will endeavor to save it for if it is destroyed, he is obligated to pay to, to return the original funds. Uh, thus, if a purchaser paid for an article and it was destroyed by forces beyond his control before he took it, the purchaser may tell the seller, give me the article I purchased or return my money, mm -hmm. even though there are witnesses who saw that the article was destroyed by forces beyond his control. Example, the seller could not save it. And he was not lazy regarding the matter. The seller must return the money. For our sages ordain that a Kinyan, K I N. Kinyan means uh, acquisition. Acquisition, K I N Y A M, right. is finalized through Mishikha, which means pulling. The pulling. Yeah. And therefore, the onus is on the seller to provide the purchaser with the article. For this reason, if the purchaser owned the house in which the sold article was held, and he was renting it to the seller, our sages did not ordain that the article must be acquired through Meshicha, for the article that was sold is in the domain of the purchase. He pays the money, 
the sale is concluded and neither can retract. So Maimonides finishes with an exception to the rule. If by any weird chance it was in the other person's possession, then the sale would be valid as mm -hmm. soon as funds were transferred. But how this is a clear answer to yeah. you your to father. You should have pulled out Maimonides. Yeah. You I'm should have. I'm sure the two insurance... Well, but what if it's more complicated? Because he said that the, the, the dealership was doing some work that the owner wanted. Mm. So maybe um, I'm giving it back to you now you know, without actually taking it because I want you to do some extra work. Right. Um, if the person never drove it out of the lot, though. This is, this yeah, is yeah, complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. Okay. Um, so what we said is the responsibility certainly lies with the person, with the seller. How about as far as retracting, if either side wants to retract? Because remember, biblical law still says what? Money. Money. Rabbinic law to protect the buyer said sale is necessary. What happens if someone wants to retract after biblical law? How far do we say this rabbinic law goes? Text 90, Maimonides. When one pays the uh, am I in the right spot? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, when one pays the money but does not perform mishkaha on the on the produce, although the purchaser does not acquire the movable prop property as we have explained, whoever retracts whether the purchaser or the seller is considered to have conducted himself in a shameful manner. He is liable to receive the admonishment of uh, Mishpara. Mishpara. And we'll say in a moment what Mishpara means. It's not fun. Even if the purchaser only made a deposit, if either of the parties involved retracts, that party is eligible to receive the admonishment of Mishpara. <laughs> what does receiving the admonishment of Mishpara involve? He is cursed in the court <laughs> and told... May he who extracted retribution from the may he may he who extracted retribution from the generation of the flood, the generation of the dispersal, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Egyptians who drowned in the sea extract retribution from one who does not keep his word. Wow. <laughs> After this curse is administered, the seller should return the money. <laughs> this is pretty harsh. I don't want that Misha Para. So what it said is, at the end of the day, the biblical law we still have to take in consideration. And that means that, um, well, no, there's the rabbinic law. The, so, so technically, could the person back out after the money was given before Mashiach happens? Well, it, this is a deposit. It's even a deposit. But this is, this they are liable to being bad mouth. That's, that's essentially what it's saying here. It's not the right thing to do, but they are able to. To do it, so if they don't says, mind getting the Mishapara. So that says, technically, the sale hasn't happened yet. Because of the rabbinic law. Nonetheless, we want to keep the biblical law in consideration. And as a result, we don't want to the, make the it easy. The biblical law happened. The biblical law did happen. Yeah. You, I thought you said. The biblical, the biblical law, law happened. happened. The rabbinic did not. Okay, right. As a result, they do allow. Legally, they can't stop the person from getting back their money. But... They say this guy does not curse him. They can curse him. Now, in the optional section, and we're low on time, so I don't want to do too much on this, what happens if it wasn't even a deposit but only a verbal agreement? Like you said, text 92. This is from the Code of Jewish Law. <coughs> Renee, do you mind reading? Text 5a. When one performs a business transaction based only on verbal agreement without any deposits or other records, it is appropriate that he honors the deal even if money has not yet changed hands, no notation has been made, and no collateral given. Anyone who renegades on a verbal commitment, whether the buyer or the seller, though he is not liable for Ms. Shepara, has acted dishonestly, and the sages were displeased with such behavior. So now we have one step less. It was not even money. He's saying, Misha par, we don't do. We don't take the guy to court and curse him. But it's dishonest. You want to behave like a mensch. We encourage, we want a society in which people do honor handshakes. We want a society where a word means something. And as a result, the sages were not pleased, but there's no legal action that can be taken if all it was was a verbal commitment. And this, it actually continues, text 92, 
Weren't there a lot more verbal commitments, I would imagine so. commitments in the past or a handshake or, you know, and, and you just trusted the other person to fulfill their side of the bargain. And as society works that way when everyone behaves that way. But if it gets to a point where people are not honoring that, well, that's when you need the 20 foot, the 20 uh, page documents, Debbie. I mean, but I, I, people, you'll often hear people from the older generation say, back in my days, life was a lot simpler. Yeah. There are far less lawyers in the world, yeah. and we just did business based on a handshake. And I think in an ideal society, that would be, that would be fantastic. Because a person's honor, their identity, their word, right. counted for so much more yeah. than right. today, who someone's trying to scam the next person back and yeah. forth constantly. Up to the late 70s, the business I worked for, and then I became the head purchasing yeah. agent, we worked on handshakes, and this was large volume transactions of material goods, not like the diamond thing. There, there was purchase order. The lawyer said you had to have a purchase order. Product was shipped and paid for before the purchase order ever did it because it was snail mail. Sure. It was all on, you told me. Yeah, the, ph the phone call. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Shook, wow. you shook my hand or did yeah. it over the phone. And then in the later 70s, that just switched because there were new people on both sides and it was very interesting. In, not paperwork, dotted and crossed. Yeah. And in the 80s, it got worse yeah. till yeah. it was a book to each side. Very interesting. And, and of course, that slows down and it was, that slows down business as and well. You, ended, you never ended up in court in a handshake. You ended up in court in a contract over an argument what a clause meant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So that last is Sage is displeased. This is not the kind of society we want to build. Nonetheless, you'll notice text 92, there's one little clause there. If all that happened was a verbal agreement, and then afterwards there's big fluctuation in price, mm -hmm. that, text 92, the sages were not pleased with such behavior. However, in the event that the market price is fluctuated, it is not considered dishonest. Some arguments say that even in a situation of fluctu fluctuating prices, one is forbidden to mm -hmm. renege. <clears throat> and if he does, it is considered dishonest. The later opinion appears authoritative. Wow. Yeah. So, m right. What do you think there? The, it's only a verbal agreement and price changes. What do you say there? The value of the dollar can be go up and down every day. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah, let's say you're buying a, a, a stock, a stock or, 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 uh, or um, you know, any yeah. goods in which the market always changes. Well, I mean... In my mind, it shouldn't matter whether it's written or it's verbal. It's an agreement. I see. In American law, real estate has to be in writing. You cannot have a verbal contract Correct. for real estate. But for everything else, you can. You can. Now, of course, there's if it's verbal, how do you you know you can prove the agreement? Well, maybe you've got witnesses and whatnot. So, you know, what, it's trickier. Do we know what the agreement was? And then you turn it back out. Those are separate issues. Correct. But to my mind, if you have an agreement, you have an agreement. And it should not make a difference if things fluctuate. Yeah. And that is, appear to be the authority, in a period. that appears to be the halakha, that there is no difference if the price changes. There is a beautiful um, quote in the Talmud, Bedover emet bil vavo, kidon ran safra, speak truth even in your heart. You shouldn't need contracts. Someone that is truly truthful, even what is going on inside, and what is the example? It says Rav Safra. Why do they choose Rav Safra? What was the story with Rav Safra? Here is the story, text 90, page 94. The story can be found in the <coughs> Shalitot of Rabbi Acha. Rabbi Safra had an item for sale, and a certain individual approached him while he was reciting the Shema and said, Give the item to me for such and such a price. Rabbi Sifra did not respond as he was reciting the Shema when interruptions mm. are forbidden. And the buyer figured that he didn't want to sell for such a low price, so he said, sell it to me for a higher sum. After Rabbi Sifra concluded reciting the Shema, he said, please take the item for the original price you quoted, for I originally intended to sell it to you for that price. There's a mention. That's going beyond the letter of the law. He wanted to be honest to his original feelings. And being that he was willing to do it at that price, mm -hmm. and it was a mistake that the person took the hesitation for wanting a price increase, mm -hmm. he was willing, he was actually yeah, sold greed. it. Greed? Doesn't the word greed comes in here? 
Well, it's sort of like bargaining. You know how yeah. if you go to a shop or a sure. marketplace and nobody, they don't respond, then you say, well, I'll give it to you. You know, you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, you, there's nothing wrong nothing's with bargaining, wrong with bargaining. And, bargaining. And, and having profit or more profit. But he didn't mean it's to a bargain. matter of agreement. In essence, the rabbi is saying, I agreed to that. I just couldn't tell you. Right. 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 And I right. want to be honest, not only with my signature. Not only with my words, but even what's going on inside. Certainly that's not something that you can, you know, take care of in court. But again, someone that truly wants to be full of integrity, that's the kind of thing we strive right. for. And that's the example it gave for Rav Safra. I'm going to skip section two here for a moment because of time and now go to section three, which is the Kabbalistic spin on this. So up until now, to summarize, biblical law says that the transfer of money alone takes care of the sale. Absolutely. Rabbinic law says that you need to do Meshicha, you need to pull it. Now, what would, how would there be any Kabbalah on this? I mean, this seems pretty straightforward. Isn't there a deal between you and God that God has lent you a soul and a body to perform to for the purpose of creating a home for God. So since he gave you this gift and he give and God gives you gifts along the way like health, a good job, give gifts like that. If you don't properly, properly use those gifts, in other words, pay God back by your actions, you are stealing, you, you are breaking a, a, a verbal contract that you've only made, you've been gifted the contract almost, but once it's gifted to you, it is yours. So you've broken that contract in by your less than mention. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful perspective. Going back to the question of, are things mine or are they deposited to me for a reason, for a particular purpose, and am I fulfilling that purpose? This text goes a similar line, a little different, but, but the same idea, and it, it boils down to the issue of whose world is this? Whose world is this? Um, Text 10. This is a biblical verse. We're on text 10 on page 98. And by way of introduction, in the Amida, at the beginning of the Amida prayer, we say, um, God is the God of fathers. Kone hakol v'zocher chazde avot. Kone hakol means he acquires. Hakol. Kol means everything. God is the acquirer of everything. And Zocher Chazdei Avot, he remembers the kindness of our ancestors. Konei HaKol, what is that description of God in the Amida when we call God the acquirer? Remember that same word, Kinyan, Konei. Konei HaKol, the acquirer of everything. I mean, God acquires? It's his. What does it mean God acquires? Remember those words, Hal, in the Amida? Konei HaKol. Being the Hebrew expert I am. Let's pull out an English Siddur. Can someone grab, how do you mind grabbing an English Siddur from, from the next room? Well, he, he asks, um, God would like to have joy from humanity fulfilling its role. And right. when people recognize God above as, as everything and everything that there is in the universe, their life and their material goods and their soul, and if they fulfill their duty to to recognize that and give, he is acquiring back what um, would give him joy to, to um, make the world perfect in the way that he wanted us to participate in its repair. I love that. Well, well said. And what you're saying is there are essentially two levels. And this goes back to something Anne asked about last week when it comes to God relating to the world. On the most essential level, the deepest level, this world is all God. You know, we speak about God speaking the world into existence. Let me use even a better metaphor. Imagine 
the world being one of God's thoughts. Okay, and I like thoughts because thought exists only inside of you. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to um, imagine a stadium full of 60,000 people and imagine them cheering and imagine them going crazy when a touchdown was scored and we, for a few minutes you had this thought going in your mind mm -hmm. and then I asked you, what would it For you to space in, that's all. They only exist inside of your mind. Mm -hmm. oh. The moment you space in, the moment you change your thought, oh, that's right. they, they no exist. longer exist. They are a product of your imagination. That's in a similar sense, there is a certain dimension. There is a certain realm in which the entire world exists within godliness. Whether you want to say it's God's speech or God's words, but it is part of God. It's not separate of God. Of course, everything belongs to God. There is nothing outside of God. That is one reality. But God didn't want us to live in that reality. I mean, if we lived in that reality and we sensed that, we would be paralyzed. We would not be able to forget about not being able to sin. We would not be able to act independently because if we sensed that every single moment we were no more than a thought of God, we would just freeze. We would just poof. Function. We could not function independently. And the goal of creation was that there should be independent, free-thinking people with freedom of choice who, while they recognize this truth, operate in a different reality, operate in a reality where we have independence. And we're not in God's thought, but maybe God's speech. And when you speak something, speech leaves you. It has a life of its own. After you say a word, people can do what they want with those yeah. words. Yeah. When you're only thinking, there is only you there. So there is the dimension of the world within God, but there's another dimension of the world outside of God. From the first dimension, of course you don't say God acquires the world because it never left him. The second dimension, though, the world, so to speak, does leave him in our reality, from our perspective. And what must we do? What have, what's our job then? Put it back to connect, to tell every single item you're not an independent existence, but you are part of God's plan. We do that with money and we do that with bananas. We do that with vacations and we do that with books. We show that the item has a soul and a higher purpose. And when we reconnect the dots, we have made God acquire this item. The Rebbe once used the metaphor of soccer. And there's a ball and the ball is the world. And we're trying to kick that ball back into God's goal. Mm -hmm. The problem is, you have, obstacles. you have obstacles as well. There's another team going the other way yeah. to make the world about I, materialism. Yeah. And the only reason the Rebbe said is that there is an other side because that's when we play our best. When you're just kicking practice shots, you're not paying with that, playing with that same competitive spirit as when there is an opposition. God wanted a home but he didn't want a ready-made home. He wanted us to have to create that home for him. Every time we utilize a material, a possession, a gift, a talent for good, we have made this belong to God. Text 10. This is a text first from the Bible, and we see that God is called the acquirer of heaven and earth. Where are we up to? Reading? And he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram to the Most High God, who acquired heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Who acquired, kone shemaim va'aretz. This is before he changed his name to Abraham. This is before he changed his name. This is actually when Abraham was battling the, uh, the, he had a little war with the four and the five kings. This is a, a story earlier. The Sidur, this is a good example how they don't want to say acquire of all things, because it doesn't really make sense. So how do they translate it here? God who creates all things. Kone HaKol is translated as who creates all things. That's not a good translation. There's another word in Hebrew for creator of all things. Bore HaKol. Bereshit bara. That's not, but it actually says creates all things because that reads easier in the English and that is why every translation is already an interpretation. The real translation here is acquire of heaven and earth. Where does that take place? Only in the lower realms, not in the higher realms. This is a Kabbalistic text, page 98. 
God's essence is far loftier. There is of levels loftier and ad infinitum than this world, for the worlds cannot relate to God. The level of God that does indeed relate to this world is a mere ray of his essence, incomparable to the luminescence of God himself. To lower himself to relate with the earthly matters and act as the origins of this world is indeed a great descent for God. And it is within the lower dimension, the descent of God, when a parallel reality is created, that is when God becomes the reacquirer of heaven and earth. As the Rebbe puts in text 12a, what is our mission statement to reconnect the dots, to show unity in all things, Renee? The idea of a sale a man's divine service is similar to what is stated. God who acquires heaven and earth, namely, that God acquires the lower realms from his nation, the Jews. The Jews effectively transfer ownership to this world to God, of this world to God, by taking it out from a state of divisiveness and distance from God and elevating it to a singular domain united with God. Okay. And now we come to the Kabbalistic Mishicha. Mishicha, we said, is pulling. When we instill holiness in items, God, so to speak, pulls that item, kicks it into the goal. That then responds, that is God pulling it into the holy domain. What is the sale the other way around? What does God give us? Blessing. In the, in the actual legal term, what does God give us? If God pulls it, what well, goes the other way? We take. Uh, right, life. Well, in the legal dimension, what did we talk about earlier in the first half of class? Uh, well, money. Cash, right? Money. Mm -hmm. So God is pulling it. He's giving us kesef. Kesef in Hebrew means money. Kesef in Hebrew also means love. Let's finish with the last text, 13b. How? After the act of mish mishicha, God gives them money, namely the person draws down a godly revelation throughout all the world, <coughs> and from that a spectacular light shines in his soul, from which a fiery love is born, and the soul within the body. This is the idea of kesef, money, a term denoting kesef, love. love. Mm. So our job is to make the world <coughs> enter the domain of God and connect the dots, and God then reciprocates with kesef, illuminating our souls with love and with light. Any questions from our online audience before we conclude today's class? Yeah, we, um, Amnon says that it also means silver. That is correct. The reason why kesef even means money mm -hmm. is because literally kesef is silver. Silver, silver was a common um, yeah. transaction. transaction and yeah. currency in a sense even yeah. more so than gold, which is more precious. Original, originally, kesef was silver. And kesef means silver, and it also, nichsafti means I desire, I love. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's interesting because in French, the word silver and money is the same word. Wow. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, somewhere in the Torah, is there the coin that's sitting under the chair? The silver coin of God? Um, you know, like, well, it, they, each human, when yeah. you give um, the coin, oh, that's right. when you give the coin to God, it's the individual count of each person. Is that also silver? Is that the yes, it is. When they it count is. the people with the kesef, the half a shekel, half a shekel, yes. and that half a shekel represents us and God in a partnership as well. And that was the half a shekel that was given. That was silver. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for joining both our online crowd. As right. well as everyone locally. So thank you, Amnon, the producer of uh, the show. And if you ever, if if anybody wants to join us, we're here on Tuesdays at 11:45 Eastern Time, USA, open to the in international world uh, at no cost. And you can find us on nissancommunications.com. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, 
Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVBI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.